Hello board gamers and welcome back to Not Board Gaming. I'm your host, I'm Mark. Now in today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at a preview copy of a game which hits uh, Game Found on Tuesday the 22nd of October. And that game is Bardsung, The Tale of the Forsaken Glade. This is a follow-up to Steamforge's previously released Bardsung, um, which takes place in a whole new kind of adventure and a whole new way of doing things. Now, uh, straight up, I never played the original Bard Sung. I know that it's got many fans out there and you know, and, and some people uh, uh, found it absolutely perfect for them and some people thought it was not quite the right kind of game for them. But what Steamforge have done is they've kind of listened to a lot of that feedback and they've made a number of changes and amendments for this latest version of Bard Sung. And I say it's a whole new adventure, whereas the original Bard Sung took place in dungeons and it was very much a kind of procedural dungeon crawler. Certainly in the one level demo that I've got, from uh, from Steamforge here, it's taking place through various paths in forests, etc. Again, procedurally, you're going to draw cards, which are going to tell you what to place or what what shape tile to place next, and it's going to create a totally unique experience for you each and every time that you play. Now, say this is uh, kind of revised from the original Bard Sung, so they've taken on board a lot of the feedback and they've made a few key changes, which I'll cover in a wee while uh, to try and address some uh, some of the um, uh, some thoughts that players had on the original Bard Sung. I say I know there are many people out there that love it. I've never played it, and it's been a game that kind of kind of tweaks my interest. I think one of the major changes is the size of the player board. I think the original Bard Sung player board was huge. This is big, but it's not so unwieldy. In fact, I can get it all on my play mat here, including the the, the, the kind of uh, the the board itself, all the various tokens and cards next to the board. So. This is a one level demo, okay? So it's not the full game that they sent me. It's very much in, still in prototype form. And it's a single level demo, which I think has been created especially so that uh, content creators can kind of tell you a little bit about the game and, and show you how the game works. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm kind of partly through one of my games right now. I must have played it, I don't know, maybe four times so far. The demo arrived kind of towards the back end of last week. So it's uh, it's been a very kind of tight squeeze to actually learn the game and, uh, and get it to the table and start playing it. But I say I'm kind of four games into it so far and I'm having a blast with it. It's a very accessible rule set. And that's one of the key things uh, about kind of Bard Sung as well is it's trimmed down a lot of the rules from a lot of dungeon crawlers uh, to a fairly straightforward rule set which allows you to have a certain element of accessibility into the game, uh, whilst also <laughs> providing a real challenge. You see, the main meat and potatoes of the game is you're going to take your band of adventurers and the uh, it's a fully caught game. Uh, the um, uh, the demo has been set up to be played with three adventurers. So I've got three adventurers on here. I've got my Dawn Guard, which is this guy just here. Uh, I've got my uh, Fire Soul, which is this person just here, uh, riding a goat and chucking fire. And I've also got my School Splitter, which is this big beefy miniature as well. There's a couple of other miniatures. I've got the Path Seeker here, and I've also got the Demon Blade as well. Uh, but I say the demo is being set up specifically for three players. Uh, sorry, for three characters. And as a solo gamer, it's not that hard to manage because you're not kind of uh, managing loads and loads of things. Each one comes with a set of action cards that allows you to take certain actions during their turn. And turns are relatively straightforward. You're either going to, you're allowed two actions on your turn. You can move, or your character's allowed two actions. You can move, you can explore, uh, or you can go into combat and fight. Um, and of course, in the full game, uh, each character's kind of attack moves are gonna be upgradable, so you get to upgrade them as you go along. Now there's treasure on the map, there's wandering monsters on the map as well, which are gonna move around the map, maybe come onto the board, and then they're gonna create a whole new dynamic as not only are you fighting com uh, combat against creatures that come onto the board, which are again, procedurally generated, but you're also going to potentially have to put up with wandering monsters who are gonna come onto the board and either spawn on the tile they come on, or maybe they're gonna to move towards you, etc. So there's lots going on in this game in terms of combat, and it is an exploration stroke combat game. The aim of this scenario, and I don't know if it's the same with all the scenarios, is get to the edge of the map, which sounds fairly straightforward. However, as you're uncovering and exploring. You're going to draw cards from either the clearing deck or the trail deck. And that tells you what tiles you're to put on there. And also whether there's any monsters or whether there's any challenges that go on there as well. So you're gonna draw these tiles 
and draw these cards, put out the relevant tile on there, and if it's a clearing tile, you're going to attach trails to the end of it. Um, so your map is going to kind of grow. Sometimes you're going to reach a dead end as well. However, you can use a staff token to clear a dead end and hopefully open up the map that way for you. So you should never really truly be stuck on any map. As I say, when you're going through the game, what's going to happen as you generally get clearing tiles is you're going to get a card like this. OK, uh, now this particular card says what map goes on there, but it also tells you what monsters are coming on here as well. It's got three, uh, sorry, two brawlers and a lurker. It's got a secondary monster, which is a pack master. Uh, and so the monsters uh, that are shown on the tile, they're put in the exact place on the tile where it shows. Any secondary monsters are put on the spawn point of the tile and any tertiary monsters are put where your echo token is. Now it's not always tertiary monsters, not always secondary monsters. They may come with additional skills as well, but you have this echo token, which is kind of going to follow you around during the game as well. So that's how monsters are spawned on the map. So all, all the time while you're trying to explore this, this kind of area to get to your objective, <laughs> these monsters are going to spawn and they're going to try and defeat you and, and, and certainly battle you. But there are things that you can do. Of course you can. Um, and we'll talk about things like the marching order and the player order and how the wandering monsters move in a bit. Um, but what I want to do is show you some of these minis as well. Now I say this is a prototype mini, but you can see the quality of the minis is absolutely astounding. And they really do make a fantastic presence on this kind of procedurally generated map as well as you're uh, moving out and exploring. And I say maybe it's a wandering monster and it's starting to come towards you. Or maybe they come out into an area where you are already and you're going to have to use the best of your abilities to attack and kill these monsters before they defeat you. You see, if one of your... And if one of your party dies that's it game over unless you use a specific token which will allow you to revivify that but there are only so many of those tokens and when you've used them in the campaign that's it they're gone so you can't start using them a lot at the beginning there may be certain cards you can get from treasure which will allow you to replenish one of those tokens so you could extend that but you've got to be really really careful with how you use them now Oh, look at this. This is kind of a big shambling monster as well, which came out and attacked me at one point, <laughs> which was kind of difficult. And the Wolf Rider. Look at here. Here we have the Wolf Riders. Absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to show you a little bit about how it plays. I'm kind of mid-combat at the moment uh, on this particular game, so I'll show you how that plays. But I just want to run through some of the... Um, some of the changes that they made to the original Bard Sunk. Now, you may notice, it's not normally here, there's another chair next to me, and that's because I have my dog Bambi here. She likes to follow me around the house and stay where I am. So I oh, just want you all to say hello to Bard Sung Bambi. There we go, look at her, she's a fearsome beast, and she would be, she, <laughs> she would be happy on the map fighting anybody at any one time, she's eager to get back to sleep. So let me just run through the changes now about what uh, what's changed from the original. So I'm going to read from my phone because this is here. Um, okay. So hero ability changes. These are amended key mechanics. Hero attack range, attack modify, and attack damage are no longer static to hero profile card. This allows them to have more levers for upgrading abilities. It allows them to create a more unique and favorable ab uh, and flavorful abilities. An example might be that an attacks that's uh, super accurate with really low damage and uh, really low damage output, or an attack that inflicts an obscene amount of damage, but is extremely low accuracy. It also makes it cleaner for players when referencing cards. All the information is in one place now, and this is true. So we have, not only do we have kind of our hero cards here, which give you, you know, detail on the heroes. It tells you what the uh, starting, um, on the back of it, it tells you what the starting abilities are. It gives you all of the information on there, but then you get their various attack cards as well. Fate. So a key aspect of it is fate. Each character has a certain amount of fate that it can do, and you can use this fate to perhaps generate extra dice or perhaps do a certain attack, which may allow you to... Um, uh, and you need to spend a fate token to do that attack. Um, however, I believe in the original Bard Sung, it was a shared resource, and it's now individual to each character because each character will have something on their card which will tell you how many fate tokens they're going to have. Um, so there's more fate to do cool stuff and more opportunities 
to create unique ways for heroes to interact with, uh, with it that are different to their allies. And it also heightens the teamwork element. And this is something I'm getting out of this as well, is the ability to kind of use one character's to potentially I know, attack or push or pull uh, a, uh, an enemy into or away from the fight and then another character, if they're right in the marching order, to actually, um, uh, to actually do that. Combat. So in the original one, you had your combat rules, which were, I think, on a D20. It's now two D6s and effectively, each of the bad guys has a toughness number up at the top, just there. You will roll two D6 uh, dice unless you've got something that allows you to do that. And if you roll above that toughness number, that means you're going to attack. It then tells you what dice to roll for that as well. So it kind of evens out the dice probability and it leads more into the use of an empowered fate spend. You see, these fate tokens, when you're attacking, you can also spend a fate token to add another dice in there as well. So really start about thinking about empowering your, um, empowering your attacks. And it also allows them to do with, more with the dice themselves on certain ability effects. Uh, the combat puzzles have been as enhanced, so there's less combats, and those that do occur are more involved and meaningful. Uh, enemies appear across multiple tiles, uh, expanding the playing area, which is obviously where the wandering monsters come in. Multiple front lines rather than a single tile scrum. That's absolutely correct as well. Enemies now have different behaviours based on different situations. You see, your enemies are going to come with a couple of maybe two or three symbols at the bottom, maybe more in the full game. And you have these kind of ability cards here, and you're going to follow these cards, basically uh, what, those, uh, what those tech tells you to do. So each one, each enemy will have its own kind of unique build, and it maybe it rushes into attack, or maybe it attacks within that area, and then it retreats, or maybe it does other cool stuff as well. So those cards are going to drive that for you. Uh, this helps build combat puzzles for players, uh, players to adapt and overcome, and it also allows a lot of variety in the enemies. Because of these, these kind of symbols down at the bottom of the enemy cards just here, it allows these unique builds for it. Uh, there's a new wandering monster system. I've mentioned these wandering monsters. What happens at the end of every round, and a round is done by marching order. I keep mentioning marching order. I'll talk about that in a second. At the end of that, you're gonna roll a D6. If that's a one or a two, which that is basically, I've failed the um, uh, I failed the wandering monster. So I have to roll for these wandering monsters. Each wandering monster on the board, you can see it here has a uh, the number of dice uh, sorry one to six on there you then roll the dice okay and the number that it is it will move two hexes in that direction so this one's moving away from the board here however if it moves onto the map just there that's going to spawn a wandering monster you're going to take a card from the wandering monster deck and it may be a wandering monster for example that, if that had gone the right way that would have uh, done a tormented soul or it may be uh, another card which potentially might not have any impact so let's find one here we've got lost blessing i think it's called uh lost rustlings there we go <laughs> this does have an effect it says here spawn a stabber on a tile containing containing the echo token and then discard this card if all stabber models are already in play after dealing new marching order the stabber card uh, gains a token instead so so you know these wandering monsters are going to come and disrupt play it's obviously easier to understand uh, than the original system and it maintains pressure and becomes more dangerous with more spawns as the encounter goes on and on and the playing area expands so the longer the game takes then the more chance you've got wandering monsters coming on there there's an all new challenge system which removes the need for leveling up multiple characteristics on the off chance that they're needed uh, it allows for more flavor than a simple um, uh, toughness number dice roll and, uh, and they're now engaging for multiple players you can add in penalties or rewards for the number of players involved and it interacts with changes to fate as well and in the chapter designs there are less nodes there's more narrative and more variety in the types of nodes uh, and a couple of creature comforts kind of user uh, user comforts if you like um, there's larger text on cards with larger symbols and a reduced mat size which i've already mentioned so those are the kind of key differences between the original bardsung and this in terms of rules as i say overall the game is very different because you're now not confined to a dungeon you're now moving out and about so before we kind of jump into the game, I just want to talk about marching order now. So at the end, uh, every round that you play the game, you're going to have a marching order. If there are no enemies on the map, what's going to happen is you're going to shuffle just your three players, uh, your, uh, your three characters cards, lay them out 
and then that tells you who's going to go in which order. Once it's done, you tilt the card, and that's it. You tap the card, and you do it. I say you're allowed to do kind of one, of, oh, sorry, two of three actions. That's move. That's explore when you start expanding around the map, or that is uh, attack if you're in combat. However, what's going to happen as well is that if there are any baddies, so at the moment I have a stabber and sorry, some stabbers and a wolf rider on the board. I did have more, but I say I'm part way through combat. You shuffle them, and this gives you the marching order for that particular round so if i was to do this now i would have first player would be my fire soul second would be my dawn guard then it would be the stabber then it would be the skull splitter and then the wolf rider and that's really important in terms of <laughs> how that comes out <laughs> can have a massive effect so you may plan for what you want to do and then suddenly the marching order is upset and oh my god uh, when it happens it can be quite terrifying because you might have planned on going first and unfortunately what's going to happen is the wolf rider or the stabber is going to go first so it becomes really really important what this marching order is uh, there's lots of cards there are battle cards uh, aspect battle cards which come out at the beginning of a battle and there are also challenge cards if they're identified there are wound cards which are two-sided so you can take a basic wound or a serious wound which will have devastating consequences potentially um, and you can build up wounds throughout the game but if you had to take more wounds than uh, than what your morale is then basically what's going to happen is your character is going to die so you've really got to be careful of that and think about protecting uh, it may not be the best thing to rush into battle maybe you want to start backing off from the battle if you're really at the back end of being wounded and letting one of the other characters kind of move forward so as i say i'm kind of way through combat at the moment let's drop you down to the table show you how combat works uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about exploration as well and show you how that works and then we'll come back up and uh, and yeah and, uh, and and finish off talking about Bard Sung Tale of the Forsaken Glade okay so here we are, we just got to the end of a round now. And uh, yeah, you can see that my players are all here. We've got the bad guys that are left over there. Now, as I say, I'm kind of mid combat at the moment. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's gone all right for me. I've managed to, to, to defeat two wolf riders so far and uh, two of these stabbers as well. So it's gone okay for me. However, what's gonna happen now is we're gonna go to the next round. I've completed everything for the end of round. So we'll go to the beginning of a round and I'll show you how a full round works. I'll kind of show you how the mechanisms work in the game as well, so it'll not be a round played as it should be. The very first thing we're going to do is we're going to re-establish the marching order. You see, each of your characters has an initiative card. There we go. We can see we've got the Fire Soul, we've got the Dawn Guard, and we've got the Skull Splitter, and they've got the initiative on the back. Then you also get an initiative card for each of the baddies that are still on the board that you're fighting. What we're going to do is we're going to shuffle these, and these are going to then create a new initiative round for us. And this will dictate who's going to go first, and this is where your game can really start to uh, obviously uh, move around a little bit. So, going first, we have the Dawn Guard. <laughs> Then we got a wolf rider, or the wolf rider that's left. Then we got the stabber. Then we got the skull splitter. And then we got the fire soul. Now, so as I say uh, earlier, on your turn, you can do one of three actions. You can move, sorry, two or three actions, should I say. You can move, you can attack, or you can explore. You can only explore from where there is uh, one of these portals here. You see I've got some blocked off areas here. So we've got a portal here, uh, had that not been blocked off, and there would be one up there, but that is blocked off. You can actually use a staff token to get rid of that and open up the map. So in reality at the moment, that one goes off the edge of the board, can't do anything with that. That one there is the only one I can take, and it's getting me close to my objective of getting off to the top of the board, which is just off the screen up there. However, we're gonna, obviously attack you'll notice that you can see down on here i've got all my characters set up i've got the uh the dawn guard uh the fire soul and the skull splitter all set up here skull splitter's got a couple of wounds and the uh fire soul has got one wound the dawn guard is okay down here uh you can see these these are the fate tokens you can use them for certain things i can empower my roles i can assist on challenges uh, other characters that are in adjacent zones or I can use them to power up certain actions. However, we're going to go with the Dawn Guard. Here's the Dawn Guard and it's this wonderful figure just here. Here we go. We can see the Dawn Guard there ready to go. Now the closest enemy is two zones away. I don't know if you can pick it up off the camera. It's one, two and they've only got one hit on them. So let's have a look at what the Dawn Guard could do. Um, we've got the Shield Bash. 
It's got a range of zero, so I have to be in the zone for them. Uh, however, before resolving this attack, the Dawn Guard can be placed into an adjacent zone. So, I could use that. That's not going to cost me anything. It's going to have two onto my roll, and I'll use a D6 for damage there. Uh, if I get a critical hit, uh, it just pushes them. Sorry, if I get a normal hit, it just pushes them. If I get a critical hit, it deals one damage and pushes them. And to get a critical hit, you have to score above their toughness. So if we just take the Wolf Rider here, you can see there's the toughness there. Okay, I have to do a roll, first of all, to try and, buy and, try and beat their T number, and then I have to get above their toughness on my, uh, my attack roll to see if I can damage them at all. Okay, so who do I want to go? The Wolf Rider's got bleed on there at the moment, so I may want to actually get the Wolf Rider. I'm going to have to use one of my actions to move. Now, the beauty about the game is having a look at what actions your players have got or your characters have got and seeing if you can interact them in one way or another. Unfortunately, the Dawn Guard has got a pull, a push action, so maybe I can push him closer. In fact, that's what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to go one, two into there, and we're going to attack this Stabber. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to roll two of my dice and I need to get above the stabber's TN number, which is this one up here. So with a roll, I need to get uh, a six or higher with these rolls. And I say, unlike the original where it was D20, you're rolling two D6s. I do actually have this uh, one token left. So I could use that to empower my roll, but I may want to save it because that would allow me to play this one here, which requires a fate token. It rolls a d8 for damage, and it's going to do damage on either hit or a critical, but it also may refresh a token for me. So I'm going to save it and hope that I can uh, do the shield bash. It says uh, I can be placed on an adjacent node. I don't want to be. Okay, I'm exactly where I need to be. Let's roll above a six here. Oh dear, it's a four. <laughs> it's a miss. Unfortunately, that's not good. I'm now in a pretty difficult area for me up there. As you can see, I'm now surrounded by all the bad guys. <laughs> not great for my Dawn Guard. He's done his two, he's done his move, and he's done this. It says here, uh, once per round, if Dawn Guard is attacked and passes her defense roll, replenish one fate. No, oh dear me. So yeah, this didn't do for me. Hold on a second, that was four. I forgot to add this. Okay, four, five, six, because you add this on there. So I have actually run. I rolled four. I've got a plus two on here, which gives me a six. That's exactly what I needed. Fantastic. I now get to attack with a D8. And as I say, this is a stabber. Their toughness is three. I'm looking to get a above a three to score a critical on this. Either way, I'm going to kill this stabber. Okay. And it's a six, okay? So I've definitely done that. Um, what this does for me on this particular one is it allows me to deliver a blow, a killing blow, uh, and also push if necessary. Fantastic. There we go. We're going to kill this stabber. He's already got one damage. They only take two, if you look on the stabber's card here. We've got this here, which says it takes two damage, and this little grave symbol here means it's dead. So the stabber is actually gone. So he's removed from the map, and then what you do is you take one of these uh, these uh, randomly uh, loot tokens here, and we're going to place them in the bag, okay? So there we go. One of them gone into the bag. Don't know what that is. It could be anything. When I get to a situation where I can get loot, who knows what I'll drag from there. So that's your kind of evolving loot bag that you've got. Oh, fantastic. That did actually work well for me there. Dawn Guard is gone, so he's tapped out. Now we're going to move to the Wolf Rider, okay? And I've got the Wolf Rider up there. Now, if we look at the bottom of the Wolf Rider card, it's got these icons down here. It says, uh, I would choose these two Aspects cards here. So this one and this one. However, he's got a Bleed token on him. That means I've already delivered two damage. He gets a Bleed token. That kind of empowers him. So we're going to do this one instead, okay? So let's have a look at this particular card. There we go. <clears throat> We've got this card here. That matches the symbol on the Wolf Rider because he's got the bleed token. Let's see what it says. It says, the first thing he's going to do is going to attack each hero in the same zone. Oh, I'm a zone away. Then he's going to charge to an unengaged hero. Well, my hero is now unengaged, basically, uh, because there's no other bad guy in his zone. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to charge, and charge means that it moves up to its move there, and its move is, here we go, its move is four, and therefore I'm only one away, and that's fine. And it's going to attack me as well. Now, all the combat is hero-facing. I don't roll for attack, I roll for defense. 
And if you look here at my dawn guard, okay, it says here, on defense, I get plus two. I'm looking to get equal to or more than eight on my roll. If I do that, his attack misses. If not, it's going to hit me. Let's have a look at that. Oh dear. I rolled three. Plus my two from uh, my defense here. That means I've only got five. He's going to hit me for, uh, with an eight, so he's definitely going to hit me. Um, <laughs> which I have nothing against there, so he's going to do a damage for me. What happens when, when you do a damage? Well, first of all, we take a wound card. So that's a wound card there. So he's got a wound card. Wound cards are two-sided. We have a standard wound and we have a more serious wound there. It's just a standard wound that's going to happen here. He can take up to five wounds. So he's still okay at the moment. Uh, that's not too bad. Um, but yeah, he's hit me, um, which is not great. So he's done a, uh, a bleed and a damage. So we've got a bleed token on there as well. Oh my God. Uh, it's not as good as what I thought it was going to be actually. Yeah. So he's done a bleed as well. So we've got a wound and a bleed token on there as well. Yeek. Okay. So he's done his move. He's tapped out. Now we've got the stabber. Okay. And the stabber, if you look here, he's got these two down here, basically. He's got this symbol and this symbol. So we're going to pull those two cards out. And we have... That one, by the way, that we use for the Wolf Rider is called Frenzied. Okay, it's a Frenzied attack. Uh, and we're looking here for the Stabber. It's going to be that one first and then this one. Okay. So, look here, we've got the two cards. You do them in the order that's on the bottom of the card. This one's going to go first. Uh, he's going to attack a hero in the same zone. Nope, nobody there. Okay. So that Bleed Token needs to go there with him. Then he's going to charge an unengaged hero. Well, I'm engaged at the moment, so he's not going to come for me. He's going to come through here, and he can move up to two. Hmm. He's not quite going to make it. One, two, and his range is... Oh, his range is one. He is going to make it. So he's going to go one, two, and now he's in range of my two heroes here, of the, uh, the fire soul and the skull splitter. So how does it do it? Well, it now does it in... Uh, initiative order. So it's going to go for the Skull Splitter here. So my Skull Splitter, who's already got a damage on him, yeah? It says if it attacked and fails his uh, defense roll, replenish one Fate Die, okay? So that's okay. I'm quite all right with that. We're going to roll this. He's got a added defense of zero, and the toughness number on the Stabber is six. So we need to roll above a six with two dice. Let's see what happens. We got nine. His attack has missed me. So nothing else is going to happen basically from that attack. We're going to move on to the second icon on here, which is the retreat. If this enemy is in the same zone as a hero, it moves up to the speed to the nearest zone does not contain a hero. If it does not have enough speed to reach a valid zone, it does not move. Well, it's a zone away, so that's okay. So that's the stabber's turn. Yeah, that kind of worked okay for me there, but that stabber is still a little bit annoying. Uh, because he can still go. Now we're on to the Skull Splitter here. So we look at the Skull Splitter, I've got one Fate Token left. All of his damage, all of his range is uh, zero, so I have to be in the same one. So my first move is going to be to where this Stabber is. Now I really want to kill this Stabber, okay? So we're going to do a Finisher move here, okay? And this Finisher move doesn't add anything onto the dice, but if I score a critical, it's going to score two hits. I just have to roll above a six with these two. So let's have a look what happens. It's a five. Oh dear. Uh, that cost me a fate token because it's got a fate token on there. So all my, all my fate tokens are down. Um, let's see. Once per round, the skull splitter can spend fate tokens to, uh, to perform an attack. <laughs> I don't have it. I could have empowered it had I got more fate tokens. I could get more fate tokens by spending one of these tokens that would replenish them, but I haven't done that. So unfortunately, that hasn't done very well for me there. So now we're now down to our fire soul, who's the last one to go here. So the fire soul here, if we look, um, we got uh, one or more enemies are defeated in the end of the phase by the burn condition, they give burn condition. Uh, then replenish one fate. I could do this, which is instantly going to give them a fire token and give them a, uh, a hit. Um, or maybe I do this ember. I don't have to move, okay, because my range is two. So I'm going to do the ember one to start off with, okay. So uh, I get plus one to my rolls. We know we've got to roll above a six. Let's see what happens. It's a nine. Fantastic. Now there's special stuff that happens if you roll uh, doubles on there as well. Okay, so what's going to happen now, because of my ember, okay, and uh, I now have to see whether I get a critical hit 
on a d4. So I've got to get above a three on a d4 to see what happens. Roll that on camera. It's a four. There we go. Excellent. Their toughness is three. I've rolled a four. I get to do one damage. There we go. And one fire token. That fire token is going to issue a burn at the end of their round for them. It's literally going to kill them at the beginning of their round. However, I've still got to move left. So I maybe want to attack again. Uh, now, you can't use the same card twice. So let's use this card uh, and uh, let's see what happens there. We have to spend a fate token for it. It's a range of one. I know I've got to roll above a six. It's a seven. There's no damage here. I instantly issue a, fate, uh, a fire, uh, uh, fire damage to this. And because it's already got a fire damage, what that's going to do is deal it a damage, which means it's actually killed the, uh, the stabber. That comes off the board and we place another one of these tokens into the loot bag. Okay. So that is everybody done there. Now we're gonna look at end of round effects, okay? What's gonna happen is at the end of the round is we're gonna resolve any condition tokens and effects. Well, nobody's got any burn tokens because they're gone. Had that burn token still been there, that would have killed that stabber, okay? Resolve any hero effects, there's none there. Uh, move the echo token. This is the echo token. If it's not in an adjacent square to uh, where your, uh, sorry, adjacent zone, tile, sorry, to where your one of your heroes is, then you have to move it there. That's for tertiary. I should have said at the beginning of the round, I'll do this battle card, okay? And it says here, each time a hero is hit by an enemy attack, after resolving the attack, the hero suffers a, uh, a poison token, okay? So I forgot to give our little Dawn Guard a poison token. What does that mean? This is an end of round effect, right? For every poison token that's on there, what you're going to do is you are going to give them a damage and also give them another poison token. So this is a way that your damage is going to rack up. Now, of course, this is a, uh, a, spe a specific one. Each battle card is different. You can see that they've got them there and we're going to rack this up with a few more poison tokens. So one, two, three. So keeping on top of this is really, really critical and key. Okay, so we've resolved that. We've done the end of round effects. Uh, we're going to make an event roll now. Remember event rolls are, are kind of in lieu of what's happening around in the forest, basically. So when you have one of these wandering monsters, if it's a one or a two, it's going to move. Let's see what we do. It's a six. It's not going to move. But say I'd rolled a one or a two, which is this. I would then roll that die again. And it would move two in that direction. So that would have moved onto there. We would have potentially spawned a new wandering monster or an effect from there. Um, we're going to deal a new marching order, resolve the other effects, and the round ends. So the new marching order, again, we're going to get these. There's no stabbers left now. So the stabber can go. And we're going to get these. And we would deal a new marching order. And the round would start again. I can safely say that looking at that, the Wolf Rider is probably going to die on the next round. So I've shown you move, I've shown you combat. The only thing I haven't shown you is explore. So let's say, for example, we were taking an explore action. And uh, I don't know if you can see, I'll just move that up. Here we go, I've removed this blocker off here. Um, we we're taking an explore action. I'm on a trail. So what you do is you would draw a clearing card, okay? And it tells you what is going to go on there. So which. Uh, which one is going to go on there? And I've just got to find the right tile, just bear with me. Here we go. It's this one, all right? So it's this particular tile that's going to go. <sighs> you can move that in any orientation. Well, good, because that actually gets me to the top of the board there. However, I would have a brawler, uh, sorry, two brawlers to add. I would have a lurker in a secondary position, which would be on here, I would put a pike monster and here a tertiary position which is where the echo token is would be two stabbers as well which would have a particular um a particular trait to them as well so you can see that this is the way that the game ramps up although that is affecting my last tile it's purely random that I pulled this out which means that i'm gonna have to do decent combat to get off there what you also do as well is because you put a clearing down you can see there's a couple of routes going off here, a couple of portals going off here. You draw a trail card for each of those, and then you would add the respective trail on there. So this would be, this one would go off there. Boom. I'll just put that on there so it does that. And then there's another portal coming off there. This would be this one going off here, okay? 
So you can see this is how the board kind of opens up. Now I've got paths now off the edge of the board, which would end the camp, uh, end the encounter for me. So end the end the game for me. If I can get through there, I'd have to load that with bad guys, and that's how it goes. But sometimes these will have challenges on there as well. Uh, and if there is a challenge that happens, you would read the text on the card. Uh, let's see, this is a good one. Okay. Place this card next to this tile. Each time a hero enters this tile, they make the test below. If a hero fails, draw a wandering monster card and spawn it on this tile. Then discard this card. Oh my god. So I've got to make a test where I've got to get three... Uh, I've got to get one... Um, uh, one success of three or more on the dice that I roll it with three dice I could then use other people's fate tokens to do that that's kind of the game in essence uh, well, certainly from the demo that we got here is you're going to wander around you're going to create this procedural map you're going to open up the board you're going to spawn monsters you're going to fight monsters you're going to pick loot you're going to lose, use tokens then of course as we get into the game proper um, you're going to start upgrading your characters there's the whole RPG element for it in the demo We've got a nice little bit of narrative as well, some of the narrative stuff that's here. Uh, there's narrative on the cards as well. There's some narrative cards that we can that we can get that are going to even open the game up even further. So the game has got like a lot of options to keep going back in and playing and replaying and really building up your characters and seeing what adventures await you. And there we go. That is a pretty brief overview on the demo copy of uh, Bardsung Tale of the Forsaken Glade that I received from Steamforge Games. Uh, as you can see, it is uh, very much a kind of rules light, uh, procedural dungeon crawler type game, lots of combat. Your map is going to expand as you kind of progress uh, throughout each campaign, sorry, each story in the campaign. And to play this one demo probably takes around about 40, 45 minutes. And I don't know what the other kind of stories are going to be in the campaign, how that progresses throughout it and what the length is going to be on there. But if you're looking back to the original Bards, and I think they were a similar thing, kind of 30 minutes to 60 minutes per story or per campaign on there. Now, of course, this is a single layer demo, so I have no idea how the rest of the game pans out with character progression, with the narrative, etc. But from what I've played so far, I've enjoyed this far more than what I thought I was going to, purely for the fact that it is so kind of accessible while providing a real challenge at the same time as well. The, the kind of uh, the procedural nature of the tiles as they come out and as the enemies come on there I means you've really got to think kind of a little bit about what order is preferred for your uh, your characters to go in you can't control that because of course you've got the uh, the initiative cards that are coming out here but also how can they assist each other can they add dice for challenges uh, are you better off empowering your attacks to get more chances to try and destroy the bad guys um are any of their abilities going to help you are there a push or a pull ability is there a range ability that's going to help etc all those things come into play and i think it, it kind of tackles the uh, the dilemma of having a dungeon crawler type game, and I say dungeon crawler because it's obviously uh, me mechanically, or uh, the mechanisms are very similar to a dungeon crawler, although it's not set in a dungeon, it is some kind of forest that I've got in this demo here. Um, uh, but it creates this really kind of accessible way into a, a, a dungeon crawler experience, which is not rules heavy, and I think that's the beauty of the game. Um, I don't know how it's going to pan out in the full version. I'm fully invested in seeing where this goes now. I want to play more. I can see this being a big hit for people who don't have lots of time to learn rules, but still want a good meaty challenge with seemingly a good narrative in there as well. Um, the character progression is going to be really interesting. The amount of wealth of monsters that you can get, I should imagine, is going to be absolutely staggering i think the only thing i would say is i'd like to see a tokens version of it as well i know obviously you know a lot of people like uh the wonderful sculpts they've got and you're going to miss out on some of the ambience and the the kind of table presence if you haven't got the the, uh, the plastic but it'd be great to see a tokens version of it as well um, <laughs> quite a few tokens already great to see a tokens version uh for those people that don't want uh, more plastic or more miniatures on there how the procedural map works is really good from these kind of clearing and trail cards. You don't know what tile's going to come out. You don't know if um, uh, if there's going to be bad guys or challenges on there as well. And how the battles kind of change with these battle cards is also interesting. One thing that we didn't cover in the demo too much is the wounds. As I mentioned a couple of times, the wounds are two-sided. You either get a standard wound card 
or you get these um, for a standard wound or a heavy wound where you flip it over and you see what the serious wound is that's on there. There's ways to reset yourself. There's a campfire action that you can do as well, which is effectively pulling everybody onto a tile, resting and resetting and getting yourself ready for the next encounter, um, which is really, really good. Uh, so you've got all the different types of encounters. You've got the challenges, the battles, etc. You've got the myriad monsters on there. They've got the way that your characters are going to progress through this story. You've got the cut down board side. You've got the revised rule sets, the fact that you're now rolling two D6s rather than a D20 for combat, and everything else that your characters can do. It feels like Steamforged have listened to some of the feedback that they got on Bardsung and tried to shape those rule sets and make it into an, a better experience. Now, as I say, I really enjoyed this. If this looks your kind of bag, it is on GameFan now. The link will be in the description below. Go and check out some other videos and see if it's for you. I can't wait to find out what the final production version has in store. We're probably a good 12, 18 months away from, I should imagine 18 months uh, from getting the final version uh, of this out to backers. But I can't wait to see what this has in store. And it's kind of wet my appetite for the original Bardsung as well, which I've never owned. And I feel like I need to get now and maybe adapt some of the new rules into the original Bardsung and just see how that plays because I'm really enjoying the experience of this procedural uh, map generation and the feeling that I have agency in everything that I do. So thank you very much for watching me on this video uh, through Bardsung, Tale of the Forsaken Glaive from Steamforge Games. It's on Game Find right now. The link is in the description below. If it looks like your kind of bag, then go and check out the Game Found page. My name is Mark. This is Not Board Gaming. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Check out our other videos. And one final thought, if you can't find anyone else to play with, then there's nothing wrong with playing with yourselves. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>